Can I get your most underrated prospect at the following? No one can see this, but air quotes positions. Um, and you said yes in the document that I sent you. So I'm just going to get right into it. Who is your most underrated guard or primary playmaking prospect? Guard playmaking prospect. Jared Butler has to be out of Baylor. Um, I just love the guy. There's nothing that he can't do to keep him on an NBA floor. You know, late in games, when you're thinking about what rotation you have, you just want to put your best five guys out there. Butler has zero flaw that would keep him off the floor. Really good defender. Very good playmaker out of the pick and roll is, is a solid passer. Scores it from three at every type of functionality way that you would want. He's really good off the bounce. And he shot over 50% on catch and shoot jumpers last year at Baylor on high volume. That's incredible. I think he's underrated, undervalued, but specifically because he's such a good shooter, we don't talk enough about his playmaking ability. I, th- I think he'd be a, an incredible pro point guard. Um, who would be your most underrated wing prospect at the moment? Uh, Zaire Williams out of Stanford probably stands out. I have him 14th on my big board. Another, I don't want to say polarizing just to, to overuse that term, but there are people who really believe in Williams and his upside and those who were completely turned off by the fact that he had a bad year at Stanford. And there's no way of sugarcoating it. He had a bad year at Stanford. Um, a lot of mitigating circumstances that might have led into that. COVID being a huge part of it, you know, not a typical year for any freshman. And I think Stanford was hit harder than any other program in the country because they weren't allowed to be on campus there. He was living in a hotel for most of the season. So a really unique type of circumstance. Like they didn't have access to a weight room. And when you're six foot 10 and weigh 13 pounds, you need a weight room. And that's what Zaire Williams is. Like he's the skinniest guy in this year's draft class and got exposed because he didn't have a typical preseason or the ability to continue to work on his body throughout the year. Um, big fan of Williams. think that six ten guys who have that type of fluidity creation with the ball in their hands and shot making are so rare that you want to gamble on them anyway. Uh, so that's why I give him kind of a lottery grade. And I think, you know, you've already talked about Garuba here for, but other than him, who would be your most underrated big man prospect? I love Isaiah Todd out of the G League Ignite. You have a, a top 20 grade for him on our big board. Um, the floor is pretty functional for him as a pick and pop stretch four. The, you know, guys like Nemanja Bielica or Nicolo Melli or anybody else who just kind of sticks around in the league and is able to, to make a, a career for themselves and find spot minutes in that role, it's valuable. And Todd's able to come in at, at his very worst and fulfill that. But similar to how guys like Emmanuel quickly uh, at Kentucky, you know, sacrificed what he can do with the ball in his hands in order to fit in with a super talented college team. I think Todd did that with the G League Ignite. You know, we talk so much about Jalen Green and Jonathan Kaminga as top tier prospects to go in the top six. And Todd helped make that happen by being much more of a floor spacer as opposed to showing flashes of what he might be able to do with the ball in his hands or operating more out of the kind of the pinch post uh, two areas. He seems very comfortable and competent to me. So I'm a big fan of his would believe in, in taking the risk on a guy like him because it's high upside with also a, a, a high floor. This is the narcissistic part of the podcast where, because I have you here, I get to ask you about the prospects I fall in love with every year that I think aren't getting enough shine. I have listed them in increasing order of my intrigue. The first of whom is Cam Thomas at LSU. And the primary reason I think I'm in love with him is the just the the shot making slash scoring, just the build ability to do it from scratch. And he, you know, to be clear, I know he's been firmly mocked in like the middle of the the first round. So he's not like super under the radar, which is why I probably have him lower. But his brand of shot making just seems like very seasoned for someone coming out of, of college. He's he's a professional bucket getter. Uh, he's got he's got his PhD in scoring. There's no doubt about that. Um, he also lives at the free throw line, which is something that I love from great scorers and, and kind of your your alphas, so to speak. Right? Can you get to the free throw line and get easy buckets there? Really crafty, unorthodox game where his jump shot almost reminds me of that of Paul Pierce. Because how many times did we see defenders that would raise up and try to block Pierce's shot before he even started to release it? because his timing is unorthodox. And I think Thomas has that to his game, which 
leads me to believe he's going to be able to get his shot off and be an effective scorer, even if he's a little undersized for his position. Uh, you don't have to talk me into Thomas. I love him. I have him as a, I think, top 17 guy on my overall board. But there are clear downsides to getting a guy like Thomas because he is the definition of a black hole. Like he can go out there and get you buckets and score, but he's not given much else. So you have to either feel incredibly confident that the shot making is going to translate and that it's worth it, or that you can string him along enough within the right culture and organization to get a little bit more out of him. I'll have you know this next one. I originally had him as the highest on my intrigue list. And then I read what you wrote about him and watched your scouting video on him. And you scared the shit out of me uh, with, <laughs> with Bones Highland, who also has been called Busy Bones, which if that nickname becomes mainstream and sticks, might be immediately one of my favorite NBA nicknames. Um, I love just the deep shot making. Um, the uh, I think you called it the contortionist finishing. I'm not as worried. I mean, you look, he had almost as high as a turnover rate as assist rate this year. That is obviously problematic, but I'm just looking at his ability to his, his shot making, his ability to attack in so many different fashions and the finishing itself. It feels like that part of his game could just open up by virtue of defenses forever being on tilt. At the same time, my original thought was when I was watching him defensively, I was like, oh, he's at least long. And if you get in a better stance, it feels like a lot of his issues could be solved. Then you wrote this whole thing about how guys who are built like him are just going to forever have problems with their stances. And so between that um, and the passing, I took the cowardly way out. I'm still intrigued by him, but he's not my mo the guy that I'm most intrigued by. I think you had him, was it 41? Is that where you had him at yours? That was, you know, if you're wondering if I play stock in your opinion, um, you scared me out of Bones Island. <laughs> well, but I'm certainly... Uh... You know, first and foremost, I'm rooting for Bones, right? Having him at 41 as opposed to a lot of consensus places that have him higher doesn't mean that I'm actively rooting against him. Unbelievable backstory in Young Man. And if you or any other listeners haven't researched Bones and, and kind of get a feel for his upbringing, I recommend you do so because he's an easy guy to try to root for. Um, you know, I have this aversion to really long-legged perimeter defenders for the simple reason that it's really hard for them to sit in a stance and slide athletically in comparison to guys who are a little bit more proportionately built. Uh, I love the length with his wingspan, but I think it catches up to him in the fact that it makes it a lot of, a little bit harder for him to sit in a stance and guard. That's really important at the point of attack because you have to be narrow and effective at getting through and around ball screens quite frequently. You know, if he's guarding opposing point guards, all he's getting is a steady diet of ball screens. So he has to find ways to, to navigate through them. I think that he's going to struggle, even though he has length to recover. I think he's going to struggle getting through them. And I wasn't overly impressed with the diligence that he tried to do so at VCU. Um, there's no doubt the, the shot making is tantalizing. Deep, deep, deep range, really good shooter, comfortable taking and making really tough ones. But you have to ask yourself what the threshold level is that he's going to be allowed to do that at the end. NBA, right? What's the percentage mark that he needs to make of those tough shots in order for it to be worth the team that drafts him and plays him really giving him the ball and saying go. And there's kind of two parts of this. One, I think that level is raised at the NBA as opposed to where it was at VCU, where he was by far the best player in the, on, the, on the floor and in the conference. So he has the license to do a lot of that stuff. The second is if those shots aren't falling at a high enough percentage, Percentage. I don't know what else he gives you basketball wise to really make playing him worth it. Not a fantastic finisher has to work on his body a little bit and, and gain strength like everybody else does. Um, don't love his pick and roll reads and passing for others. And certainly the defensive worries compound all of that. So I'm, I'm more so not in that I don't see the upside and the intrigue to a guy like bones, but I'm perfectly comfortable in letting someone else take that risk because I don't know the best way for me to, if I were a you know, player development coach, I don't know how I would work with him to try to overcome some of those shortcomings. So you're saying if the Knicks took him at 32, that'd still be okay. It wouldn't be yeah. a huge reach. Yeah, it would not, no, it would not be a, a huge reach at all. Um, and certainly again, I understand the, the appeal to a guy like bones, but I'm, I'm just, I'm out on him because I, I think defense matters, especially in this draft class. 
probably the deepest in recent memory for good point of attack defenders. Um, the, my final two guys that I, that I have on this is um, Io Desumu is there. I find myself thinking I'd probably be a lot more intrigued by him if he was a little bit bigger. Um, I also found myself wondering what if he upped his three point volume or was a more willing three point shooter and then was hitting them at a higher clip. You then wrote to me in the doc, um, compared him to Donovan Mitchell, which is just not something that I, and you said it wasn't a perfect comp, uh, but that was not even like that exceeded my expectations. So he's like a guy that I'm, I'm zeroed in on and I want to do more work on. I haven't looked too much at what he would bring defensively. Like I said, if he were a little bit bigger, this might be Shea Gilgis Alexander's level of love for him that I brought when, uh, when SGA was, was coming into the NBA. Yeah. I mean, he does have about a six, nine, six, 10 wingspan. Like he's long, but he's not overly big or built and he is not a phenomenal athlete. Uh, I think the Donovan Mitchell comparison comes into like what his role at Illinois was, where he was asked to do pretty much everything and did it and did it all well enough, but wasn't incredibly efficient in any major area. That's the, the Desunmu that we saw over his time at Illinois. I don't think that that translates to being an alpha at the NBA level, but I, was, I said those similar things about Donovan Mitchell coming out of Louisville where I thought he was more of a, a bucket getter and a system and an offense that needed him to be so. And I don't like the level of sh- tough shots that he's made in the NBA. Didn't see that coming from Donovan Mitchell when he was in college. Desumu could surprise me in a similar way. I think he has the, the capability of doing so, but it's a very different kind of downside for a guy like Desumu because I don't think he has that one strength to hang his hat on if he doesn't end up becoming you know, a late clock type of offensive option. He's an okay shooter, but not a great one. He's a good, not a great defender. Like doesn't have a true natural position. There are just so many things about him that you say, okay, if he's not scoring with the ball in his hands the way he did at Illinois, how's he impacting the game? I don't, I don't have the clear answer, but there is somewhere wrapped up in all of the things that he does and all of about who he is that makes him a, a top 20, 25 talent. My final guy, and uh, he would have been number two again, but you 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 dissuaded me out of busy bones before we even started this podcast. Trey Murphy the third, I am a, he just seems like an all around really good player, and I'm curious why he's not higher up on draft boards when you're looking at the, some six foot nine is what he's listed at, can defend, um, score off motion. Is it really just because he doesn't have the scoring off the dribble experience? Is that what's holding him back? Maybe combined with it's so, I feel so stupid saying this, but like, oh, he just turned 21. Like maybe that's a little bit, um, like what is it that's keeping him in a, in like the, the mid late, like I've seen him listed everywhere from like early thirties to like in the forties at some point. So what's keeping him from like rising? I feel like he should just be a lot higher up. Yeah. So Murphy 50, 40, 90 player this year at Virginia as a role player and an unbelievable on ball defender. Like those combinations, just framing it in that regard should make you want to fall in love with a guy like him. And that's where the Mikhail Bridges comparison really comes to fruition. A lot of people who see what Bridges is doing well at the NBA level and, and in the NBA playoffs and say, well, Trey Murphy can do that. He's long. He knocks down shots from the perimeter. Um, you mentioned the off the dribble playmaking and scoring. Like, I don't think that that's his role at the NBA level. And I don't think that it's, the absence of being great in those areas moves him down draft boards. I think it's more so the fact that NBA caliber players need to have a certain requisite level of talent with the ball in their hands just to survive in the league. Because if somebody pressures you on the perimeter, you have to be able to at least drive past them or bounce it a couple of times to get them off. Um, And I have very little faith in Murphy in that area. Like, and some of the earlier scouting notes that I have, I have a scouting notebook with about 30 or 40 pages of notes on a lot of these guys. And some of, the earliest, <laughs> some, of the, some of the earliest notes that I had on Murphy were pray he doesn't bounce it. Like you just, you have, you have to be really good athlete, great finisher in the open court where he can take maybe one bounce unimpeded and dunk it really good on back cuts along the baseline and knows how to move without the ball in his hands. Really good spot up shooter so good in all of these areas, but if he doesn't get a shot off cleanly or know where his next pass is going, like I I just, I worry about what he has to do, putting the ball on the floor. Um, He took six shots at the rim off of spot ups and attacking back closeouts last year, six. 
12. That's, and I think you, I can't remember this was from your video. He took like 10 pull-up jumpers versus 114 catch and shoot jumpers. It was just something mind boggling that he just wasn't it's clear that he probably put the ball on the floor incredibly rarely. <laughs> well, and, and from a role player standpoint, you're fine with that. You don't want your three and D role players coming in and taking a lot of dribble pull-ups, but you, there's still a, a floor level of just basketball talent and skill that everybody has to be able to have to, to bounce a basketball to survive at that level. And I, I'm worried that Murphy doesn't necessarily have it. If he did, he'd be a top 25. Player. So it's kind of a thing versus, you know, you're looking more at when the tools of his game where it was clear that Mikhail Bridges had the outline of more. This is more of a Reggie Bullock type guy where it feels like he could be very different players, but just his skill set is going to be very finite within, or his role is going to be very finite within the NBA. Like you're, he can become overextended on offense specifically rather quickly. Yeah. And, and we see this every year, Dan, where somebody's a quick riser after the NCAA tournament because they have an awesome performance. And all of a sudden they're jumping up 10, 15, 20 spots on draft boards and go way earlier than they should. I call that the Malachi Richardson plan. Um, it just happens every, every year. Somebody just rises like that. And then there's, you know, people who watch the NBA playoffs and the finals and they see one guy that they didn't expect to pop off. And they say, Oh, I want to find the next version of him because what he does is so valuable. And I think that's Mikhail Bridges this year, which is why Trey Murphy is starting to rise a little bit. I think it's has less to do with Trey himself for one of the reasons he's a, a prospect that's trending upward and as much to do with the fact that everybody loves to compare him to Mikhail Bridges and saw Bridges do well. So if, you know, two plus two equals four, then you're going to draft Murphy earlier than you might have thought otherwise. Well, I apologize to these four players in advance for ruining their careers by becoming fascinated with them before they enter the NBA. 